Out of the Dust Me and Mad Dog Arlie Wanderdale, who teaches music once a week at our school, though Mom says he's no teacher at all, just a local song plugger, Arlie Wanderdale asked if I'd like to play a piano solo at the Palace Theater on Wednesday night. I grinned, pleased to be asked, and said, that'd be all right. I didn't know if Ma would let me. She's an old mule on the subject of my schooling. She says, you stay home on weeknights, Billy Joel. And mostly that's what I do. But Arlie Wanderdale said, the management asked me to bring them talent, Billy Joe. And I thought of you. Even before Mad Dog Craddock, I wondered. You and Mad Dog, Arlie Wanderdale said. Darn that blue-eyed boy with his fine face and his smooth voice. Twice as good as a plowboy has any right to be. I suspected Mad Dog had come first to Arlie Wonderdale's mind, but I didn't get too riled. Not so riled, I couldn't say yes. January 1934 Permission to Play Sometimes when Ma is busy in the kitchen or scrubbing or doing wash, I can ask her something in such a way I annoy her just enough to get an answer, but not so much I get a no. That's a way I've found of gaining what I want, by catching Ma off guard, especially when I'm after permission to play piano. Right out asking her is no good. She always gets testy about me playing, even though she's the one who truly taught me. Anyway, this time... I caught her in the slow stirring of biscuits, her mind on other things. Maybe the baby growing inside her, I don't know. But anyhow, she was distracted enough. I was determined enough. This time I got just what I wanted. Permission to play at the palace. January 1934. On Stage when I point my fingers at the keys, the music springs straight out of me, right hand playing notes sharp as tongues, telling stories while the smooth, buttery rhythms back me up on the left. Folks sway in the palace aisles, grinning, stomping, and out of breath, and the rest, eyes shining, fingers snapping, feet tapping. It's the best I've ever felt playing hot piano, sizzling with mad dong, swinging, with the Black Mesa boys, or, on my own, crazy, pestering the keys. That is heaven. How supremely heaven playing piano can be. January 1934. Birthday for FDR. I played so well on Wednesday night, Arlie put his arm across my shoulder and asked me to come and perform at the president's birthday ball. Ma can't say no to this one. It's for President Roosevelt. Not that Mr. Roosevelt will actually be there, but the money collected at the ball, along with the balls all over the country, will go in the president's name to the Warm Springs Foundation, where Mr. Roosevelt stayed once when he was sick. Someday I plan to play for President Franklin Delano Roosevelt himself. Maybe I'll go all the way to the White House in Washington, D.C. In the meantime, it's pretty nice, Arlie asking me to play twice for Joyce City. January 1934. Not too much to ask. We haven't had a good crop in three years, not since the bounty of 31, and we're all whittled down to the bone these days, even Ma with her new round belly. But still, when the committee came asking, Ma donated three jars of applesauce and some cured pork and a feed sack nighty she'd sewn for our coming baby. February, 1934. Mr. Hardley's Money Handling. It was Daddy's birthday and Ma decided to bake him a cake. There wasn't money enough for anything like a real present. Ma sent me to fetch the extras with 50 cents she'd been hiding away. Don't go to Joyce City, Billy, she said. 
You can get what we need down Hardly store. I slipped the coins into my sweater pocket, the pocket without the hole, thinking about how many sheets of new music 50 cents would buy. Mr. Hardly glared when the Wonder Bread door banged shut behind me. He squinted as I creaked across the wooden floor. Mr. Hardly was in the habit of charging too much for his stale food, and he made bad change when he thought he could get away with it. I squinted back at him and gave him Ma's order. Mr. Hardly's been worse than normal since his attic filled with dust and collapsed under the weight. He hired folks for the repairs and argued over every nail and every little minute. The whole place took shoveling for days before he could open again, and some stock was so bad it had to be thrown away. The stove clanked in the corner as Mr. Hardly filled Ma's order. I could smell apples, ground coffee, and peppermint. I sorted through the patterns of the feed bags, sneezed dust, blew my nose. When Mr. Hardly finished sacking my things, I paid the bill, and tucking the list in my pocket along with the change, hurried home so Ma could bake the cake before Daddy came in. But after Ma emptied the sack, setting each packet out on the oilcloth, she counted her change, and I remembered with a sinking feeling that I hadn't kept an eye on Mr. Hardly's money handling. And Mr. Hardly had cheated again, only this time, he cheated himself, giving us four cents extra. So while Ma mixed a cake, I walked back to Mr. Hardly's store, back through the dust, back through the Wonder Bread door, and thinking about the secondhand music in a moldy box at the shop in Joyce City. Music I could have for two cents a sheet. I placed Mr. Hardly's overpayment on the counter and turned to head back home. Mr. Hardley cleared his throat. I wondered for a moment if he'd call me back to offer a piece of peppermint or pick me out an apple from the crate, but he didn't, and that's okay. Ma would have thrown a fit if I'd taken a gift from him. February 1934 50 miles south of home In Amarillo, wind blew plate glass windows in, tore electric signs down, Ripped wheat straight out of the ground. February 1934 Rules of Dining Ma has rules for setting the table. I place plates upside down, glasses bottom side up, napkins folded over forks, knives, and spoons. When dinner is ready, we sit down together and Ma says, Now! We shake out our napkins, spread them on our laps, flip over our glasses and plates, exposing neat circles, round comments on what life would be without dust. Daddy says, the potatoes are peppered plenty tonight, Polly, and chocolate milk for dinner, aren't we in clover? When really, all our pepper and chocolate, it's nothing but dust. I heard word from Livy Killian. The Killians can't find work, can't get food. Livy's brother Reuben, 15 last summer, took off, thinking to make it on his own. I hope he's okay. With a baby growing inside Ma, it scares me thinking. Where would we be without somewhere to live? Without some work to do? Without something to eat? At least we've got milk even if we have to chew it. February, 1934. And I think we'll call it a day there for now. And we'll continue with this next time. Till then, thanks so much for listening. I love you guys. Bye-bye.